Hello and welcome back to Picks and Portraits. Over the last couple of months, we have been looking a lot at dead media memories, uh, be it the media itself, video rental, where it was sold, uh, dead malls, retail. Uh, I have always been a fan uh, of media, <laughs> physical media, and through my life I have seen many trends, uh, formats even come and go. Uh, I doubt I'm alone in that, and so today I like to officially <laughs> kick off a new series, Media Graveyard, where we are going to be digging up different media crazes from the past. In this first episode, we will be venturing into uncharted territory, uh, at least for this channel, music, audio media by looking at a forgotten phenomenon, the official movie soundtrack album. When I think of this, I see it mostly as a trend of the 90s. Uh, that could just be <laughs> my subjective experience. Obviously, music has been closely associated with film since the medium's conception, and songs are still being licensed in movies today, uh, but we will be exploring a very specific packaging of this pairing uh, that is more or less dead. Now, it's difficult to talk about audio uh, without actually playing the music, so we will be featuring commercials for different soundtracks, uh, talking about the movies, the artists, uh, any other nostalgia around its release. Uh, but first, I'd like to give a little bit of time to the places that sold these albums, as uh, they too have largely disappeared. Music retailers, record shops. In addition to countless independently owned stores, Corporate record store chains were fixtures of malls in the 80s, uh, 90s, <laughs> even into the 2010s. Tower Records, uh, Sam Goody, HMV, which we cover pretty extensively in our Retail Graveyards video. Uh, While well, these places eventually diversified their stock, offering movies, uh, clothing, uh, even tablets and iPods, the backbone of their business was always physical media, music, uh, CDs, records, cassettes. There were also music club catalogs, like Columbia House, where you could order CDs and other media through the mail. Uh, some of Columbia House's methods uh, or business practices are pretty wild in hindsight. They would send you, everybody, ordering forms uh, and run promotions where you could get so many albums for a penny uh, or free by agreeing to purchase a set amount at full price later. Uh, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Uh, quite a bit, actually. Uh, these were easily exploited by people, uh, just grabbing a bunch of albums for free and never paying, and uh, never following up. Music used to be very expensive. <laughs> a new album could run you uh, upwards of $25 back in the late 90s, uh, just for inflation that's nearly doubled today. One album, 50 bucks. Buying albums could also sometimes be a gamble. You know, you like one song you heard on the radio, uh, buy a band you don't really know, pay for the album, and you learn uh, you really don't like <laughs> their other stuff, uh, or maybe they're just a one-hit wonder. Singles, popular songs from albums, would be released, uh, but not for every artist or every song. That's one of the reasons movie soundtrack albums were so great. Uh, if you just wanted one song, you could get it, usually mixed with similar songs in the same genre, uh, or sometimes introduce you to other artists, something new, uh, depending on how eclectic the soundtrack was. Uh, the same could be said for compilation albums, uh, like Now <laughs> or Big Shiny Tunes, uh, for my fellow Canadian millennials out there. These collected songs or hits from various artists a uh, convenient way <laughs> to get a bunch of music without having to buy entire albums. Music also used to be much less accessible. If you were not lucky enough to have a good local record store, getting some lesser known albums, uh, stuff from smaller labels was pretty difficult. Obviously 1999, 2000, everything changed with piracy. P2P sharing programs like Napster, uh, Kazaa, LimeWire made it possible for entire discographies, uh, or just a single song, to be downloaded illegally for free. Uh, this often gets credited with uh, quote-unquote killing the music industry, uh, but if anything, I think it pushed it to a whole new level. First with iTunes, which allowed legal purchase and downloading of MP3s, uh, to then streaming services like Spotify. Um, I don't know, <laughs> maybe the money isn't as good as it was for previous generations, but discovering music and having your music discovered uh, is a whole lot easier than it used to be. Like I mentioned earlier, the idea of pairing music with a movie has been around since the beginning. Uh, when screening silent films, it was custom to have a score played uh, along with the images. 
early movies, especially cartoons, uh, were used to promote music owned by the studio. Uh, in a way, they are like uh, proto music videos, <laughs> but traditionally, feature films really didn't feature popular music. Uh, the music and songs that appeared were produced specifically for the movie, uh, first as scores or uh, musical numbers, and then later as theme songs. The difference between a score and a soundtrack a score is a type of soundtrack uh, that is usually instrumental, composed specifically for the film, where a soundtrack consists of licensed songs that are featured in the movie. Uh, these can be the same as a score, playing over scenes, or be diegetic, meaning they are actually playing inside the world the film presents. Songs can be produced specifically for movies. Uh, think of any of the Disney or Bond songs. Uh, others are chosen and fit the tone of a movie so well, the two become forever linked. Uh, you can't hear the song without picturing the scene it was featured in. The curation of songs to represent the themes and setting of a movie is something that I find interesting. Uh, if the film is about youth or loss, different time periods, a lot goes into deciding the best fit and we are left with a mix or a playlist that encapsulates these moods uh, or ideas, periods. Now, there are a couple different kinds of soundtracks. There are original soundtracks, an album of songs that were featured in the movie. Sometimes the soundtracks would have sound bites uh, from the movie, uh, different quotes, uh, hopefully <laughs> separate tracks, but it was common for these quotes uh, to be unskippable, uh, which was frustrating. They were connected to the tracks. There were some cases also where songs featured in the movie were omitted from the soundtrack. Uh, this is a uh, pre-Shazam world, and if you are unfamiliar uh, with several of the artists uh, featured on the soundtrack, it's possible that you would buy it thinking that one of the many unknown songs was the one you liked, uh, only to be disappointed uh, when they weren't. Another variation was soundtracks labeled music inspired by the movie, which takes this idea one step further with labels including songs they believed fans interested in the movie would also like, uh, but weren't actually featured in the movie. So, now that we have an idea of what these soundtrack albums were, I'd like to look at some notable examples, uh, as well as soundtracks I remember fondly. <laughs> we are going to try to move chronologically, uh, starting all the way back in 1938 with Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. This is credited as the first commercially released movie soundtrack. It is a musical, and musicals lend themselves nicely to soundtracks, uh, obviously. One of the most beloved films of all time, The Wizard of Oz, was released in 1939, but the soundtrack didn't come out until 1956 uh, to coincide with the first time it appeared on television. Uh, it's pretty shocking, <laughs> considering how iconic Judy Garland's Over the Rainbow was. Uh, the version heard in the film was also not available until 1956, but different versions were recorded and released. It would be a few decades, uh, the late 1960s, early 70s, before we'd see a lot of pop artists uh, contributing to soundtracks. The Graduate with Simon and Garfunkel, uh, some of the duo's songs, including Sound of Silence, were used by director Mike Nichols and editor Sam Osteen. During the editing process and fit so well, they decided to make them part of the official soundtrack. Nichols also contacted Paul Simon about incorporating new songs into the film. Uh, Simon had been working on something around nostalgia, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and John DiMaggio. Uh, Roosevelt was changed to Robinson and a prototypical version of Mrs. Robinson with slightly altered lyrics made the final cut. Robert Altman's 1971 film, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, is a western set in the early 20th century. Despite being a period piece, its soundtrack included three songs by Leonard Cohen, Winter Lady, The Stranger Song, and Sisters of Mercy. These originally appeared on Cohen's debut album, but after the film came out, uh, they would be released as a single, uh, in Europe at least. The next year, The Harder They Come introduced the world to reggae music. Uh, this follows an aspiring singer who has to resort to crime to make his dreams come true. This singer, Ivan, is portrayed by Jimmy Cliff, uh, who is all over the soundtrack. He produced the title track uh, specifically for the film and contributed five other songs, uh, while other then-recent reggae hits round out the album. Surprising no one, I am fascinated with time, <laughs> how it passes, and uh, what it leaves, the way aesthetics and trends date different periods. Uh, this is very obvious in our next film, 1977's Saturday Night Fever. 
this is a perfect snapshot into late 70s American pop culture because this movie had a huge influence over it. It established John Travolta as a star and elevated disco music's popularity to the mainstream. A hugely popular film supported by an even more popular soundtrack featuring disco hits uh, with several songs written and performed for the film by the Bee Gees. Just an iconic soundtrack. By the 1980s, a soundtrack featuring pop music uh, was pretty much the norm. This was the decade of the music video, MTV, and many songs that appeared in movies featured clips from those movies in their official music videos. Flash Dance, starring Jennifer Beals, Irene Cara's What a Feeling, and Maniac by Michael Cimbello book in the album. Footloose, another incredibly popular soundtrack. It was number one for two months, and seven of the nine songs featured were released as singles. Uh, footage from the film also found its way into the video for Footloose uh, by Kenny Loggins. I have mentioned before how Back to the Future is one of my favorite movies. Uh, the music video for Huey Lewis and the News' Power of Love uh, from the first Back to the Future featured a cameo by Doc Brown, as well as the DeLorean. Dirty Dancing was another massive film, massive soundtrack that spawned many music videos like Eric Carmen's Hungry Eyes, I've Had the Time of My Life as well. Uh, given how pop culture functions today, it can be difficult to imagine anything being relevant for a month, let alone four, but that's how long the Dirty Dancing soundtrack stayed at number one. An incredibly popular film uh, and soundtrack. And now we have arrived in my lifetime, <laughs> the 1990s. We've looked at Dirty Dancing and Saturday Night Fever, the third and second best-selling soundtracks ever. The number one best-selling soundtrack album of all time is 1992's The Bodyguard, anchored by Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You, an absolute banger. Uh, this was a cover of a Dolly Parton song that was produced for the film. The soundtrack was basically a Whitney Houston album. Uh, she recorded multiple songs for it and also starred in the movie. This was Will Smith's shtick as well, uh, back before he was broken, <laughs> or whatever's going on with him these days. He starred in many blockbusters, contributing a hit song to a couple of soundtracks, uh, Men in Black, Wild Wild West. Like in the 80s, music videos were produced using scenes uh, or just straight up characters from the movie. Uh, given his background in hip hop, this is a pretty good fit uh, and a great multimedia strategy. People hear the song, they think of the movie. Uh, longtime fans know how much I love a good pop culture phenomenon. In the summer of 1995, Batman Forever was everywhere. <laughs> this was one of the first blockbuster media events that I remember. Uh, there were toys, fast food tie-ins, uh, those McDonald's frosted mugs, uh, Pogs even. Uh, the soundtrack had a couple of hits, like U2's Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me, and Seal's Kiss From a Rose, which was an absolute mega hit. Clips appear in the video. Uh, this movie is not highly regarded at all, but this song is an all-time classic. I was in martial arts as a kid, and the 95 Mortal Kombat soundtrack was on regular rotation. Uh, same with the sequel, Annihilation. Both terrible movies that I love deeply. <laughs> Something I'm sure you've noticed as we've gone through time is uh, how much film techniques developed. Also trends in music. Uh, we started with uh, Snow White, and here we are <laughs> with industrial music, rap, metal. Godzilla 98 gave us Godzilla the Album, uh, which was a very eclectic mix, featuring Green Day's Brain Stew, uh, complete with Godzilla roars embedded right in the track. <laughs> the big single was uh, Diddy, formerly known as Puff Daddy, featuring Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page performing Come With Me. Another massive hit, Titanic, with Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On. Titanic was the number one film in America for three months. Again, something unheard of today. Uh, 1999, The Matrix soundtrack, a great time capsule. No surprise, around the time of music piracy exploding, these soundtracks began to grow obsolete. Uh, single songs were now more accessible. Uh, the industry in general was going through a major shift. But as I said at the beginning of this video, licensed music still appears in movies and TV. Uh, soundtracks uh, continued <laughs> to be released. Post-2010 examples, uh, 2011's Drive has an excellent soundtrack. Uh, 2013, Frozen's Let It Go was everywhere. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, the newest Star is Born remake uh, with Lady Gaga. Uh, this month, even, the recent Kate Bush resurgence, thanks to Stranger Things. 
still happening. Uh, playlists are still being compiled of music featured in movies, but in the age of mass accessibility, the purpose they once served is unneeded. So, I will have this serve as my eulogy to the movie soundtrack album. Let me know what you think. What are some of your favorite soundtracks? What did I miss? This channel is 100% viewer supported. We do not run ads. We are funded completely through Patreon and patrons help keep this whole thing going. Uh, these videos and sleep core coming out regularly. In exchange, we offer a ton of exclusive content monthly. Uh, we have dozens of videos and series over there that you can get access to for as little as five bucks a month. So please, if you have the means, consider supporting us. Patreon.com slash Pixel Portraits. Uh, there are other ways to help as well. If you enjoy this video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and uh, share it. Tell a friend. <laughs> I would love to revisit a similar topic in the future, maybe compilation albums, as we mentioned. But that is it for today. As always, thank you all so much for interest in this channel, and thanks for watching. See you in the future.